Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I am Nanny Joanne. On today's video, I am going to be doing a book review on an extremely interesting book that I read recently. It is about vaccines. So I'm not a mother, but I have my own beliefs about what kind of vaccines I will and will not be giving my child. And I feel like in this day and age, especially with everything that's been going on, this is a question that is perhaps, you know, bothering some people. What kind of vaccines do I give my child? Do I space them out? Do I not give them vaccines? Do I really need to be giving my kid a hepatitis B shot, a tetanus shot? What do these vaccines even mean? Are there other remedies, maybe a homeopathic alternatives that I can be doing? I don't want to sound old school, but you know, what if I give them tea? What if I give them a shower in oatmeal? What if I give them like a diffuser and have them sniff a clove of garlic? Do these things really work? And are there other alternatives for those parents who don't want to vaccinate their child? So in this video, I am going to be letting you know at home what this author says, the name of the book, obviously, some normal common viruses that children get, what are some other alternatives if you don't want to take the vaccinated route, and just a whole bunch of like really interesting facts that I myself didn't even know prior to reading this book. So if you want to learn more about the unvaccinated child, please stick around and remember everything that I'm telling you is it comes from an author, but remember, not everything that you read, not everything that you hear, not everything that you see is a one-size-fits-all remedy. No, take this with a grain of salt and you yourself as a mother or mother-to-be, just make your own decisions as far as what you want to do and what you believe is best for your child. Now, this book sparked my interest because in the near future, I plan on conceiving and having a baby, and I know that there's a lot of misinformation going on and a lot of things out there that are really scary and alarming. So whether you're spacing out or you're not gonna do the vaccine things, this is a book that whether your kid is vaccinated or not, you should read. I will obviously link this book in the description below. And today, as I said, I'm gonna be giving you a review on what I have learned since I did read this book. All that good stuff. So the beginning is just like an overview of diet, fruits, vegetables, proteins, healthy fats, grains, how important it is for you to drink water, how important it is for your child and your baby to drink water as well. Now the book mentions that breastfeeding is the best prevention in preventing ailments or diseases or sickness or any type of virus that your kid contracts. I'm sure you know that the mother's milk is full of healthy fats, proteins, good nutrition, and that in and of itself can prevent your child from acquiring many of these diseases. In this day and age, a lot of parents are so concerned about keeping their child clean. No, no, don't eat off the floor. No, no, don't get your hands dirty. Get out of the dirt. Stop playing with bugs. But what we fail to realize is that there are so many microorganisms and good bacteria in this dirt. It says that if your kid plays in dirt just one time, a year later, you will see those healthy microorganisms still in their body. Like, that's amazing. Like, let your kids play in dirt. And if you have dogs or cats, even better because they will pick up these microorganisms from their paw, from their snow, from their snout, from always sniffing, from the fur. Let your kids play and touch these dirty animals, the dirty soil, because it's actually beneficial for them. It will, in, in a sense, help them build up their immune system. So when looking at homeopathic remedies, these come in different forms. They come in tinctures. They come in the form of a bath capsules, essential oil, glycerites, um, salve paste, in syrups, in teas, and that's basically it. As the book mentions, which I thought was super interesting, it says that researchers have not discovered a new class of antibiotics since the 1970s, and more and more of these microbes are developing re resistance to these antibiotics. So what does that mean? It basically means that these doctors, some of these antibiotics that we are prescribing our children, they're not really working anymore because our bodies have built up kind of like 
a toler an immune tolerance for them. So these doctors, since the antibiotics are not working as well as they used to be, they're going back to these more historically used solutions for a sick child or for somebody who has some kind of virus infection. So if you choose the route of having essential oils, it says that essential oils should not be ingested and it should also not be applied on its own on skin because children and babies have very sensitive skin. So to dilute these, use things such as infusers or some kind of like topical paste, you know, combine like a drop or two with coconut oil or vegetable oil. And to remember that less is more, one or two drops is plenty, more than enough and it'll get the job done. A way that you can use these essential oils is by inhalation. Just get yourself an inhaler, a mister, a diffuser, topically. Now we all know that when you're sick, okay, what's the first thing that we tell our kids? All right, get some rest, stop jumping up and down, drink some water, don't overexert yourself. These are all basics that the book covers and it just gives you like a kind of like commonsensical kind of approach on things. Now it also shows you and teaches you that there are different types of fevers. A low grade fever is a fever that is 99 degrees to 101 degree. Now here, your child may not be exhibiting any symptoms. They may be still playing, their personalities haven't changed, they're not lethargic, they're just being themselves, but their body temperature is a little bit hot. A child with a higher temperature, maybe let's say 102 to 103, they will not be as energetic. They're gonna be more lethargic, perhaps not eating as much, and they just wanna rest. Now, if a fever rises above 103, it should be addressed because this can indicate a deeper state of infection. So take now, normally you don't have to like completely rush to the doctor unless it's an infant less than three years old who is exhibiting these extreme body temperatures. A lot of people are concerned about brain damage, but brain damage will not occur unless the temperature maintains at a steady 107. So if your temperature is going is at 107, 108, but it's going down gradually, worry not about brain damage. Worry when like it's at 107 and it's just steady. It's, you know, right there. Cause that is like, all right, give me everything you need to give me. Antibiotics, give me a cold bath, give me wraps, give me cold socks, give me everything cold. Cause we need to bring this temperature down. When you should call your doctor is if they have a temperature of 104 or more and it's not going down if they're not responding to medicine, if your child is less than three months old. And of course, if your child is irritable, they're having trouble breathing, they have stiff neck, and they basically are not mobile. They're not moving. They're just like completely like done, lying in bed, leave me alone. Now, when your child is sick, there are certain foods that you should give them to promote good health and energy, such as quinoa, raw fruits and vegetables, oatmeal, toast, things of that nature. And along with foods that you should be incorporating, there are foods that you should be eliminating when your children are sick. First and foremost, eliminate dairy, milk, cheese, eggs, all that stuff. Obviously eliminate processed sugars, candy, high sugary cereals, anything that is sugar and dairy, eliminate. And be careful exactly what fruits you're giving your child because some fruits like bananas, mangoes, peaches have more sugar than others, such as like the berry family. So try to stick more to the berry family and not the more sugary fruits. Now we're gonna go into the conditions part of the book where it basically lists all the viruses and diseases ha that concern parents, such as chickenpox, measles, influenza, hepatitis B, tetanus meningitis, mumps, polio, rubella, all of these. And, many, and within these many chapters, it tells you what kind of oils, tinctures, teas that you should be giving your child if you're doing this more holistic approach. So I'm just gonna give you guys a few examples here. It's more, um, some of the more popular and concerning ones. So of course, let's start with chicken pox. So it says, today we see about 700,000 cases nationwide. It can have several complications for younger children than one year of age, as resulted in about 150 deaths per year. Today, we see about 30 deaths per year in immunocompromised children, such as children with HIV. And in general, you will see a rash. It usually starts on the head, 
then chest, then back, and then it spreads through the rest of the body. And the rash typically is pink or red bumps, which break out over several days and eventually develop into blisters. The blisters will break and leak a little bit of fluid and then the scab will fall off. So the book also shows you some pictures of what chickenpox may look like for a couple of kids. Now it says there is no conventional medical treatment for chickenpox. Doctors will prescribe topical creams to relieve itching and they might also prescribe antiviral medications. Okay, so what do you do if your child has chickenpox and you've thought about it and you didn't vaccinate them when they were a kid for chickenpox because you believe that you could have done this on your own, which you totally can. A lot of people did, my mom did. So you can start off with herbs. Now there's a couple of herbs here like nettles, lemon balm, burdock, antiviral herbs such as elderberry. Um, these are all herbs that you can give your child to consume. And there are also some essential oils that you can give them like chamomile, tea tree, lavender. So if you wanna do the whole bath thing, it gives you a couple of ways to put these herbs in the water and how to properly dilute them. But fear not because chicken pox isn't something like fatal, you know? Let's look at hepatitis B because this is one that I was like, I'm not giving this to my kid at all. This is just silly. Why are we giving our kids hepatitis B shots? And you will find out why the book says it's not necessary. All right, let's begin. This is my, this is my favorite one. All right. Hepatitis B is a virus that infects the liver. It is transmitted from mother to a child during vaginal delivery if the mother is hepatitis B positive. So if you have hepatitis, then if, and you have a vaginal natural birth, guess what? Your child's gonna get it. So in that case, it would be beneficial for you to give your child the hepatitis B shot. But if you don't have hepatitis B, why am I giving my child a hepatitis B shot? Okay, so continue listening. So hepatitis B is transmitted from the mother to the from the mother to the child during vaginal delivery if the mother is hepatitis B positive via IV drugs or contact with blood, saliva, semen, or other open wound of an infected person. Hepatitis B infection is concerning because it is a lifelong infection once acquired. People who are most at risk for contracting hepatitis B are people engaging in risky behaviors such as unprotected sexual intercourse and IV drug use. So tell me again, if I am not hepatitis B positive and neither is my partner, then if I have vaginal birth, my kid will not be hepatitis B positive. So why am I giving them a hepatitis B shot? Okay, follow me. They want to give our children hepatitis shots as a precautionary measure, right? So that they're, so that if one day, God forbid, they so happen to use drugs and get, you know, stick a needle, a dirty needle into their vein, or they meet someone who has AIDS, that's why they want children to have this hepatitis B shot. Okay. I mean, I guess, sure. Now, these are remedies, but they're not cures. So for a lot of these diseases, such as hepatitis, there is no cure. As it says here, there are no conventional medical treatments available for acute hepatitis B. Once it becomes chronic and liver problems have developed, there are various medications used based on the type of liver disease that has manifested for the person. Another one that is super prevalent that we always hear of our children getting vaccinated is with the measles, meningitis, and mumps. So let's read about those. All right, this is the measles chapter. Children at most risk of developing severe complications are less than five years old. With mass vaccines, susceptible ages of infection have been pushed out to older than 10 years old. Symptoms of measles include cough, runny nose, sensitivity to light, itchy rash, a fever, loss of appetite, diarrhea, and generalized swelling of lymph nodes in front of the ears. And the most common complication of measles is diarrhea, followed by ear infections and pneumonia. And two or three days after, you may see tiny white or red spots. Now, for measles, it says that the only treatment available through conventional medicines is vitamin A. So if you just Google 
What foods are high in vitamin A? Boom, give your kid a lot of vitamin A. They also suggest the topical lotions that you can make here in the book if they have developed a rash. And again, it shows you what herbs, you know, nettles, burdock, you know, elderberry. I think I'm gonna have to get elderberry because elderberry is repeated here a lot. A lot of mothers have also vaccinated their children against polio. And again, this is another one that I'm over here like polio. Didn't that happen like hundreds of years ago? Okay, so, but let's read on to see because I was ill-informed about this polio nonsense. So let's see. All right. Polio is alarming for parents to consider because of its ability to, for its ability to cause paralysis in children. But the good news, the good news in the United States is that no cases of wild type occurring naturally polio have originated since 1979. The last imported case was said to come into the United States in 1993. As of 2015, eight countries reported cases of polio. None of them were here in America. These were Afghanistan, Guinea, uh, Guinea or Guinea? I'm not sure how to say that. Um, Madagascar, Nigeria, Pakistan, Ukraine, you know, those, those kinds of countries way out, out there. Um, but... It also says that one of the strongest protective factors to prevent polio is breast milk because obviously the mothers pass on certain antibodies and certain good bacteria from breast milk. So I, f I feel like all in all, this book is a great read because it informs you of all the vaccines that are given to our children that may or may not affect them present day. Polio. Why are we giving our kids polio? It's, this has basically been eradicated and through herd immunity, nobody has polio here. There hasn't been a case since 2015, basically. I'll do one more. Um, one that's also really popular is the tetanus shot. So let's see what it has to say about tetanus because people are like, oh my God, don't touch that dirty nail. You're going to get tetanus. But let's see if that's where tetanus comes from. Tetanus is an infection caused by the anaerobic bacteria Clostridium tetanani. All right. It can affect a person through a puncture wound with an item that had the bacteria on it. Okay, so if you touch a nail and it had tetanus, then you can get tetanus. Sure. All right. Historically, people came across it living on farms because the bacteria lives in the intestines of cattle, sheep, and small animals like guinea pigs, rats, cats, and dogs. It is found in the manure of horses and other farm animals. So if you live on a farm... Worry about it. If you don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, rates of tetanus infection have consistently dropped since the year 1900s. So imagine where we are now. Like if it was dropping back then, it's basically like non-existent now, I'm guessing. I don't know. As more people started living in the cities and having less and less contact with farm animals, today a wound can become infective it is if it is exposed to contaminated feces or dead issues. So if you have an open wound, don't touch poop and don't touch dead cells. Shocker, people. Shocker. <laughs> the most up-to-date number of people affected is from 2009 with 19, 1, 9, 19 cases reported to the CDC and two deaths two deaths in the u.s data from the cdc show that the greatest number of people affected were over 65 years of age pretty that sounds kind of familiar of those people nearly one third of them were diabetic or iv drug users tetanus is not contagious all right so i don't know for me this book was super eye-opening because you hear about, no, you need to give your kid a tetanus shot, the chicken pox, you know, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, everything. Just make sure that they're never, ever, ever sick. And if they get sick, they're going to die. And you're the worst person ever. And it's like, whoa, I have enough stress as a first time mom or second or third or fourth or however many. I don't need this extra pressure from society telling me what I need to give my kids. Like there's other measures. I don't have to 
shoot them up with these drugs that may not even work. In this book, I didn't read it to you, but one of the viruses they had, I think it was probably influenza, the flu. They had a shot, a secondary shot and a booster shot. And it said that the CDC recommended not to get that third shot because basically it was overkill. You were doing too much and then your body wasn't going to respond the way it should. This is all very, very familiar based on what's going on in the world now. And listen, I'm not against vaccines. Um, this book is not telling you not to get your child vaccinated. It's just letting you know these are the more popular vaccines that are given to our children. Some background information, present day information. And if you choose not to vaccinate your kid, it gives you homeotherapeutic remedies such as oils, tinctures, bath bombs, infusers, you know, cold sheets, cold baths, what to feed them, what not to feed them, what these illnesses look like, what to expect. So I don't know. I feel like instead of everybody rushing to the doctors as if they were God, have some faith in yourself, read a book, get informed, and you might be surprised. All right, guys, if you liked this review on this book, pick it up. I am not sponsored by this author. Um, I'm just reading up books that I think are interesting for myself and so that I can prepare myself for when my time comes to step into a hospital and have a baby and they're going to ask me, do you want this shot, this shot? How are you going to space them out? It's like, uh, let me just read some more. I'll get back to you on that. So guys, again, this book is The Unvaccinated Child, A Treatment Guide for Parents and Caregivers. I will link it below. If you thought this book was interesting, if you think it's a fraud and it should be taken off the bookshelf, shame on you. Um, no book should be taken off the bookshelf unless it's like how to make a bomb and kill your own people. But that's neither here nor there. Anyways. If you're interested, pick it up. If not, I just gave you a brief synopsis. You can find this information, I'm sure, on Google. Definitely not on YouTube. Definitely not on YouTube because I have searched high and low for information on vaccines on YouTube. And of course, it's a touchy subject, so that's not going to be on there, unfortunately. But um, I think your alternative may just be to buy a book. Maybe this one. I don't know. Anyways, guys, um, I'll see you guys all next time in the review section of my YouTube channel with another book coming at you super, super soon. And <laughs> it's funny. Um, I have it over there, actually. So the next book that I'm going to be doing a review on is called How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor. <laughs> that should be a doozy. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So I'll catch you then.